Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I would like to thank the ICH for giving me the opportunity to present uh, data on uh, DAFI today. First, I have to say that I have no disclosures to announce. So the protein that I will talk about today is encoded by the CPP2 gene. And we know of this protein that it's uh, activatable by thrombin. And if it's activated, it exerts an antifibrinolytic effect through the cleavage of lysines and arginine residues. So the carboxypapidase effect is labeled. And due to the different features of this protein, a number of names of the same protein have been disposed throughout the literature. However, in our laboratory, we always call it TAFI, or thrombin activatable fibrinolysis inhibitor. And throughout the rest of my presentation, I will refer to this protein as TAFI. So fibrinolysis occurs when plasminogen is converted into plasmin by plasminogen activators. Lysine residues exposed on a fibrin degradation products can bind simultaneously plasminogen as well as TPA, and the conversion of plasminogen to plasmin is accelerated. Upon activation of TAFI into TAFI A, the lysine residues are removed, and uh, the cofactor function of the fibrin degradation products is abolished. So TAFI attenuates fibrinolysis. TAFI is uh, secreted by the liver, and it's a glycosylated cymogen, and the glycosylation is uh, most heavily in the amino terminal part of the protein. And the concentration in healthy individuals is about 10 micrograms per ml, or 180 nanomolars. So upon activation of TAFI by trypsin-like enzymes such as plasmin, thrombin, or the thrombin thrombomodulin complex, the activation peptide is released, and the TAFI A moiety is active. However, the active conformation is very unstable, and it converts immediately or very rapidly into an inactive form, which is further cleaved by trypsin-like enzymes. A number of SNPs have been reported in the CPP2 gene, but only two of them result in an amino acid substitution. And this is the one at position 147, where it can be either an alanine or a threonine, and at position 3 to 5, where it can be either a threonine or an isoleucine. And the alanine at position 147 and threonine at position 3 to 5 are the most abundant one. So the two polymorphisms result in four different TAFI isoforms. As I told you before, the enzyme is very labile, especially at 37 degrees. But the amino acid at position 3 to 5 determines the half-life of the protein. If there is a threonine at this position, then the half-life is only 7 minutes. If there is an isoleucine at this position, then the half-life is extended to 15 minutes. A number of groups have made efforts to induce mutations in order to stabilize the TAFI A structure. And our uh, group has um, mutated four residues, and this way we were able to make a mutant with a 180-fold increased half-life. And this TAFI variant was also uh, crystallized by the group of uh, Joost Meyers here in Amsterdam. And in this ribbon diagram representing the crystal structure of TAFI, you can see the activation peptide in gray and the TAFI A moiety in green and orange. And the sphere here, indicated here at position 92, is the uh, cleaved side. So all the mutations that stabilize the active conformation are located here in this alpha helix, and this is called the dynamic flap region. So how can you now quantify TAFI? There are different ways to quantify TAFI. First of all, you can quantify the total amount of TAFI using either an antigen, ELISA, for example. However, already 10 years ago, we have demonstrated that the commercial ELISAs that were available at that time used a polyclonal antibody, which did not react with the isoleucine 3 to 5 form. And this led to the underestimation of the patient carrying isoleucine at position 3 to 5. However, most of the ELISAs available now do work with a monoclonal antibody that can react with both forms. Another way to quantify TAFI is by activating TAFI into TAFI A, and this is mostly done by adding thrombin thrombomodulin, and then this TAFI A will cleave a chromogenic substrate into a colored product. The most commonly used chromogenic substrate is hyperyl arginine, 
and it is converted by uh, TAFI A, but also by CPN into hyperic acid, which is then colored into a uh, colored product. The group of uh, Dirk Hendricks from uh, Belgium made a lot of efforts in um, designing specific substrates that are only uh, cleavable by TAFI A and not by other carboxypeptidases present in plasma. Another method to quantify TAFI is not to quantify TAFI as such, but to quantify the reaction products that are formed upon cleavage of TAFI. So you can either quantify the activation peptide by using an ELISA, or you can quantify directly the TAFI A activity that is formed. However, as I mentioned before, TAFI A is very unstable, so you have to take a lot of precautions to be able to measure the TAFI A activity. So your sample has to be on ice. You can also add some inhibitors to stabilize the TAFI A form. And again, you can use this chromogenic substrate assay. The group of Paul Kim also described another assay to measure TAFI A. They made use of an um, inactive variant of plasminogen that was fluorescent labeled, and then they added a um, fibrinogen degradation product which were labeled with a quencher, and then they measure the amount of quenching. So the more TAFI A is present, the more quenching you see of the fluorescence. So these are all direct methods to measure the TAFI A activity. However, there are also a number of indirect methods that can be used to measure the effect of TAFI, of TAFI inhibition. And this is the clot lysis assay, the thromboelastography assay, and a channel loop. So first of all, the clot lysis assay. So in this assay, you take plasma, you recalcify it, and you add to induce a coagulation, and then you add TPA to induce a fibrinolysis. In doing this so, you have this typical clot lysis profile, where in the axis you can see the time in minutes, and the y-axis you can see the optical density. So up on recalcification, you first see the coagulation and then the lysis, and you can use a number of parameters to characterize your inhibitor, for example, the amplitude here, or the 50% clot lysis time, which is the difference between the maximal turbidity and the half-maximum turbidity, or the area under curve. And the more TAFI A you have in your sample, the longer the clot lysis time is extended. Another way to test TAFI inhibitors is the use of thromboelastometry. Here you use whole blood, citrated whole blood, you add calcium, and we always use a small amount of tissue factor as well to activate the coagulation, and we use TPA to induce fibrinolysis. The um, viscoelasticity elasticity is uh, measured, and this is a typical thermogram in which the alpha angle represents the rate of uh, clot formation and which the maximum lysis represents the um, lysis of your clot, so this indicative for fibrinolysis. Another way to uh, measure TAFI, the effect of TAFI inhibitors is by using a channel loop system. In this, again, you're using citrated whole blood, and you add a labeled fibrinogen to it, then you rotate the blood and you form little thrombi, and these thrombi are taken out after a certain time period, and they're bathed in a solution that contains TPA, and the release of fluorescence is measured afterwards. So the more TAFI A you have, the less fluorescence is released. So these are all in vitro methods to study the effect of TAFI inhibition. However, there are also a number of animal models described to study the effect of the TAFI knockouts, but also to study the effect of small molecules that inhibit TAFI A directly. And rabbit models have been used, rat models have been used, and mouse models have been used. If you want to test the effect of antibodies, different models can be used. One group used the baboon model, and we used a mouse model. So this slide is just to show you that a number of companies have been interested in developing TAFI or TAFI A inhibitors. However, until now, none of these inhibitors made it into the clinic. So the core business of our laboratory is the generation of monoclonal antibodies and also the generation of nanobodies. And I will talk about this antibodies and nanobodies now. So in our laboratory, we have generated a panel of mouse monoclonal antibodies towards different human TAFI variants. And we have shown that these antibodies can either hamper directly the TAFI A activity. We could also show that these antibodies reduce clot lysis time in a clot lysis assay. We also identified antibodies that do not hamper the TAFI activity as such, but that hamper the thrombin mediated TAFI activation.
And we also could demonstrate that these antibodies have an effect in clot lysis and also in a Chandler loop. And the group of Bizar, they also made a similar antibody and they demonstrated an increased fibrinolysis when this antibody was administered to baboons in an E. coli-induced sepsis model. Furthermore, we were also able to identify antibodies that interfere with the plasmin-mediated TAFI activation. And again, we were able to show that they reduced clot lysis time, that they increased fluorescence in a channel loop system. And one of these antibodies, it's the 26D6 antibody, is an antibody that was raised against human TAFI, but it cross-reacts with rat and mouse TAFI. And therefore, we could use it in vivo model and we chose for the in vivo model in which we injected tissue factor to the tail vein. And this is to evoke thrombi. And then we isolated the lungs and we quantified the fibrin deposition in these lungs. And we saw that upon administration of this 2066, there was a decreased fibrin deposition in the lungs of these mice. So as conclusion from the antibody experience, we can conclude that the antibodies can target both the activation of TAFI as well as TAFI-A directly. That also the thrombin thrombomodulin as well as the plasma-mediated TAFI activation seems to be important. However, in vivo studies are scarce because we only have one antibody that cross-reacts with mouse and rat TAFI and can be used in a mouse model. And therefore, we thought it would be interesting to use these antibodies in mice that express human TAFI, and these were available through the laboratory of uh, Joost Meyers. So he has made mice in which do not contain mouse TAFI, but that do express human TAFI. And when the mice arrived in our laboratory, we first wanted to see if they could be uh, used in our uh, thromboembolism model. So we injected uh, tissue factor in these mice. However, we saw that upon injection of tissue factor, the fibrin deposition in the mice that express human TAFI is much less compared with this in the YTAP mouse. And moreover, we also saw a large variability between the different mice. So this made us conclude not to use the mice to show a differential effect of the different antibodies. So as I told you in the beginning, we do not only generate monoclonal antibodies, we also generate nanobodies. What are nanobodies? Well, more than 10 years ago, it was discovered that in the serum of Camillidae, that they're next to the conventional antibodies that they also have heavy chain antibodies. And these are a type of antibodies that are devoid of a light chain. And you can recombinantly express and purify the variable fragment of a heavy chain, of a heavy chain antibody. And this is called the VHH, or briefly, we call it a nanobody. So we also raised nanobodies towards different TAFI variants. And we saw that similar as with the antibodies, that these nanobodies could interfere with the TAFI-A activity directly, also could interfere with the thrombomodulin-mediated TAFI activation and with the plasmin-mediated TAFI activation. We also observed some of the nanobodies that did something with the tafi zamachen activity, but I will come back to that later. So also for the nanobodies, we could demonstrate in a clot lysis assay that there were able to reduce clot lysis time, and this we could demonstrate as well for the antibodies that have a direct effect on TAFI-A as the antibodies that hamper the TAFI activation. Another advantage of the nanobody is that if you add the nanobodies after the clot has been formed, that these nanobodies are more effective than a monoclonal antibody. And this is probably due to the difference in size whereas a nanobody is tenfold uh, smaller than an antibody. So from the nanobody experiments, we can conclude that they can interfere with TAFI samogen activity, with the activation of TAFI, and with the TAFI-A activity. That due to their size, they can penetrate better into clots. However, the disadvantage of this nanobody is their very short half-life, and again, they have a lack of cross-reactivity with mouse and rat TAFI, and this hampers, of course, the mouse model studies. To come back to the Zamogen activity, well, a few years ago, this was a matter of debate, because some groups claimed that TAFI on itself had a Zamogen activity, and some groups claimed the opposite. However, the discussion was ended by Jonathan Follow, who demonstrated that the TAFI Zamogen is effective in cleaving small substrate, 
It has a limited ability to cleave the plasmin modified fibrin degradation products, which are large products. And this can be again explained by this crystal structure of TAFI. Again, this is the ribbon diagram representing in gray the activation peptide. And as you can see from the slide, it might be possible that some small substrate can intrude into this TAFI structure, but it's impossible for large molecules. In our panel of nanobodies, we also discovered two nanobodies that had a stimulating activity on the Zamagen activity of TAFI. So probably the mechanism behind it is a displacement of the activation peptide, which opens up the activation site and making the TAFI Zamagen more TAFI A like. And this is possibly an application for attenuating inflammation. But I will come back to that later. So TAFI plays a role in fibrinolysis. The group of Derek Hendricks already demonstrated in 2004 that uh, vibrinolysis is hampered as long as the TAFI A concentration is above a certain threshold value. As soon as this TAFI A concentration drops below the value, then fibrinolysis proceeds. What about the role of TAFI in thrombosis? Well, a number of groups have made TAFI knockout mouse and they found no overt phenotype and no abnormalities. However, in some groups, if they used a trigger, then they did find that TAFI deficiency leads to reduced thrombus weight, to an increased lysis, and we found also that it reduces the accumulation of fibrin in the lungs. So from these studies, we can conclude that the localization, the strength, and the duration of the stimulus determines the role of TAFI A. Also for the role of TAFI in humans, as I mentioned in the beginning, the normal concentration in healthy people is about 180 nanomolars. However, in the beginning there were some conflicting uh, reports, but this was probably due to the used methodology, since this ELISAs they were not able to recognize the isoleucine 3 to 5 form, and also because they focused on measuring the total TAFI and not the amount of TAFI that is activated. However, ever since, a number of studies have been shown that there is a relationship between TAFI or TAFI activation and a number of cardiovascular diseases like stroke, arterial disease, and so on. Next to the role of TAFI in thrombosis, TAFI also plays a role in inflammation. As I mentioned in the beginning, it's a carboxypeptidase. It's also able to cleave small substrates, and some of these small substrates have a role in inflammation. For example, C5A, which is a potent anaphylatoxin. And a number of studies using either mouse models, but also in humans, have demonstrated that TAFI A has anti-inflammatory properties. So this made us think when you want to develop a TAFI inhibitor or TAFI A inhibitor that you would like to use, uh, you would like to have this TAFI inhibitor to have strong pro fibrinolytic properties, but you will certainly try to avoid to have inflammatory properties. It's not advisable. So therefore we think that a TAFI inhibitor should inhibit the TAFI A activity towards large substrates, but not towards small substrates. And one of these antibodies that I mentioned before, it was the antibody 26D6. This antibody was tested in the laboratory of uh, Professor Colucci from Italy, and he found that next to the inhibition of the plasma-mediated TAFI activation, that this antibody also hampered the TAFI A activity on a vibrant surface, but not on a small molecule like osteopontina. So this is a potentially TAFI inhibitor, with pro fibrinolytic activity, but without this pro-inflammatory inducing properties. Moreover, since this antibody also cross-reacts with mouse and rat TAFI, it can be used in mouse models to test the effect. So I think the take-home message is a lot of clinical studies have shown that there are patient populations with an increased TAFI or an increased TAFI activation. There are assays available to measure either TAFI or the extent of TAFI activation. We have animal models available, rats, dogs, rabbits, and we have a toolbox of TAFI inhibitors available. So I think a development of a TAFI inhibitor is coming up soon. So I would like to thank all the students. First of all, I would like to thank my colleague Paul de Klerk, of course, and then all the students that were involved in the TAFI research. In um, green are the students indicated, the former PhD student, students that did their PhD on TAFI, 
and in red are the students that are currently busy working on TAFI. Maarten will present an e-poster this evening, Tine will present an e-poster tomorrow, and Lisa will present an e-poster on Wednesday. I also would like to acknowledge Jonathan Foley, Paul Kim, and Nicola Much for helping me out with the state-of-the-art paper. Thank you very much. And I also would like to thank all the collaborations of the past 13 years. And I thank you for listening.